Hey Miami, this is Dr. John Bennett presenting another in the series of, of Radiologist TV. Uh, today we have Imran Karasi, MD. He's going to talk about 3D printing and 3D printing in medicine. And now I'm going to turn the show over to Fike Sheikh. Good evening, Thank Fike. Well, Thank good afternoon, you, John. Fike. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, John. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Fike Sheikh. I'm the co CEO and creative director here at radiologist.tv and a molecular imaging uh, physician by profession. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Imran Qureshi, who is the um, abdominal imaging and informatics fellow at uh, the prestigious University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore. He also is the um, informatics contributor here at Radiologist on TV. Today, uh, Dr. Qureshi is going to be talking about 3D printing in medical space. It's a very interesting uh, topic. It's getting a lot of attention these days, and we're happy to um, have him here to talk on that topic. So welcome to the show, Dr. Qureshi. Thank you so much. Let me just go ahead and get this started. Thank you for that welcome. Um, yeah, like you were saying, 3D printing in the medical space is a hot topic. There's a lot of stuff going on right now in, uh, in uh, 3D printing and a lot of new ideas coming out there, but not, not much has solidified yet into, into, uh, into any large company. So. Uh, the objective of, of this presentation is to give you a good background of, of 3D printing, how it all works, uh, and what I really want to do is showing you, you know, what what is going on out there in the medical space is also giving the tools so that, you know, tomorrow you can go out and uh, do your own project. Um, because the more more we have uh, this in the media, the more we have people doing this, the more we have people showing their uh, clinicians uh, what, what can be done with 3D printing more this can you know be out there to help patients um, so again you know just basically a brief history we'll go through the tech of 3D printing uh, the supplies that you need uh, before you start to print current uses I'll, sh I'll show some of the interesting things in, not in the non-medical space but we'll concentrate on the on the medical space what's 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 out there and then we'll end by uh, a little step-by-step -step how to and then I'll do a little show and tell on, on different things that we've done over here at uh, at Maryland. So, uh, so a brief history of uh, 3D printing. So it's actually been out there for quite a while. Uh, the main thing is that it's it's been kind of hidden in the uh, in, not in the consumer space, more in the manufacturing space. Uh, it was actually in '84 that handsome-looking gentleman on the left with a with a mustache is Charles Hull. He actually developed the first patent for 3D printing, uh, serial lithography, using uh, UV light to cure a resin. We'll go through that a little bit more in detail. Uh, in 89, fused deposition modeling was uh, developed by Scott Crump and also patented. They both have now their own companies, uh, and FDM is actually what's now in the consumer space, so ever since it came out uh, in 09, the first printer, uh, BFB Ratman, uh, it's been explo exploding. You know, at first people were just doing you know art things with it, but then it then it you know people realized that there's a lot more functionality in there. Um, and, and actually, it started in 07 when a company Shapeways first created their an online um, company where you can send them your file and they'll print it for you. But then right after that, you know, in 2009, uh, BFB uh, Ratman came out. And so that machine there on the right is, I think, the third generation of the BFB uh, Ratman. But it looked, it looked similar to that. So just, just a little bit about the tech behind 3D printing because it's kind of, it's kind of vital to know exactly what's going on, how the tech works uh, before you start a 3D print or, you know, to, just to understand what's possible and what's not possible. So what is 3D printing? Just, just in general, 3D printing is something we call additive manufacturing. So you know, there's, there's two ways to manufacture something, uh, a 3D object. One is by sculpting it, which is you, know, you start off with a big block and with lasers or you know, sculpting uh, tools, you chip away uh, parts of it, right? So you're, you're, you're breaking it down into the object you want. What 3D printing does is the opposite, is additive, is additive manufacturing. So all 3D printing methods, there is, you know, maybe six or seven of them, three popular ones, basically go layer by layer, de depositing or somehow curing 
one layer at a time uh, and, and moving up or moving down or sideways, uh, but it, it does one layer at a time and so it, it's, it's, added, it's an additive process. So the three types of 3D printers out there that are the most popular, um, first, uh, well, okay, first let me start with stereolithography. Down there in the left corner is uh, what we call stereolithography. Uh, this is the first one that was patented, patented in the 80s. So how this works is that you have this liquid resin there, and then you have the, the plate kind of submerged in the resin. Um, a laser with a UV light cures one layer of material, and it so it turns into a solid plastic, and the bed sinks down just a little bit, so just one a little layer of resin can go over the previously produced layer. And so and then, it, you know, whatever the next layer is, it cures that and it goes down. So it's, it's slowly sinking in the, this resin and it's making that object where it's making that, uh, making that chest piece over there. Um, then selective laser sintering, it's what we see there on the right side. Very similar process, except there's not resin. It's actually a powder. It's powdered metal. There's more than one type. and how exactly they're uh, polymerized is a little different, a little, a little more detail than we need to go into, but it's similar. Where you have a build cham chamber and you have a, a, a bed there, and with laser it fuses one, um, one layer at a time and it slowly moves down so that you can build the whole, whole uh, object. It's actually th those things, th both of these have very high resolution, however they're also very, very expensive. Um, they're they're not you know they're they're cost restrictive right now for the regular consumer. What we can do is fuse deposition deposition modeling, uh, like you know what I showed here. This is more of a fused deposition modeling um, technique, where you have plastics uh, that are extruded by an extruder. This is just a you know a hot um, a little nozzle there that plastic goes through, and it melts it. And it, and it knows exactly where to deposit it uh, layer by layer. And it also moves down. Uh, the only difference, the, 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 the you know, pros and cons, F, uh, FDM is much cheaper. I think the cheapest printer that I've seen is about $800, but I think they're getting even cheaper. The Probably the uh, kind of the Cadillac of, um, of FDM right now is the uh, MakerBot uh, Replicator 2X, which is about 3000 or uh, $2,800. Um, so it's more in a range of being affordable. Uh, the filaments are not, not that uh, expensive either. So that's, that's what, you know, um, what most people use. That's what we've used in our projects and stuff. And it's good for pro prototyping something. So just to show you what a 3D printer looks like, this is the MakerBot Replicator 2X. It's basically the same one that we use in our projects. Um, you know, you have the filament feeder on top, uh, that's where the filaments go in. Uh, there are basically types of plastic that will be extruded. Um, this one, and the one that, that we've used, ha it has two uh, extruder heads. So that, that's one current limitation of 3D printing. Uh, there's only one method, porcelain, that can have more than one color, but the majority of 3D printing, you can only print in one color. They are developing some in the future that have more than two heads, so they can do more than uh, one color. Um, but right now, this is this one one of the limitations. Um, the, and the reason that there's two filaments is because one is actually for uh, support struts, which will be chipped away, dissolved away, and the other one is for the, your actual material. Then you have the extruders that that get hot. You have the printing bed, which is also also hot and mo moves down uh, as each layer is made. Then of course you have the control panel uh, down there on the left where you input everything, you have your SD card. It's all encapsulated in plastic because it has to keep a certain uh, tolerance for heat, um, it, well, small tolerance for you know the variability to keep everything smooth. Um, because if it, you know, it's uh, some prints can take 10, 20 hours and if one layer gets messed up, if there's a little glop there that comes out, it can ruin the whole thing because it just keeps on translating up. So the, the, the last technical piece I want to talk about is the actual data that you need for your 3D printer. So it's a STL file. That's, that's the most popular file type. 
Uh, I think there's one or two printers that might have a more proprietary type, but you know most of them use a uh, .stl, which which is a stereolithography file. Uh, they are different from CAD files. That's important to note because CAD files um, have the entire voxel data. CAD file, you can have you know you can have teeth and you can have arch the architecture in inside the teeth and all the different layers. Uh, STL file is actually just surface geometry, so it's going to be a much smaller file, but you don't have all the internal structure. So it's just a surface geometry because that's what's going to be uh, printed. Uh, and so all the stuff that's inside, um, and this is one of the things you have to keep in mind when you are making an STL file, you have to make the insides all hollow uh, because uh, it can't print, it can't print uh, uh, the space insi inside your object. Um, another thing is you have to make sure you don't have any non-manifold geometry, which basically means it has to be airtight or water, they call it a water seal. Uh, that, so no edges are touching each other with just one point or one face. Um, and then again, with, uh, with at least the FDM type of printing, uh, if you, you can't have overhanging edges that are more than 45 degrees. Uh, if you do, so for example, if you're printing a, you know, upside down, like a roof on a house, and you can't have this hang out in space, so what, it would, what the printer will do is it will create struts here by itself, so it will waste a lot more uh, plastic, again, dissolvable plastic, so that you can have that strut. But if, as long as you are 45 degrees, uh, you can print it without having extra struts. Other, other... Yeah. Little thing you can do is you can make custom struts so that you don't have to um, mess with the with the dissol dissolvable plastic. So just uh, let's go over the supplies that are needed uh, when you do a 3D print. Again, I'm concentrating on the on the, uh, on, the on the FDM because that's kind of what um, what's most available and easiest for most people to do. So there's two types of filaments. There's the uh, uh, polylactic acid and the ABS, and they're, they're a little different. Uh, so the PLA is much more fragile. Um, it's not as heat resistant. So you know, if you have it in a very hot place, it can start getting, start melting. Uh, but is biodegradable, right? So you can throw it away and not feel too guilty about it. Um, it's best for like if you ha if you have objects that you, you don't you know for display um, that you don't want people to touch all the time, but you just want to put somewhere to to display. Uh, it does. It does actually have a little bit smoother texture. ABS, however, is slightly malleable, so it, it doesn't. It does. It kind of. It kind of bends. It's good for moving parts. It's not. It's not fragile. I mean, it's still plastic, so you can still snap it. But um, it's. It's. It's still. It's like you know, manufactured plastic. Uh, it's more heat resistant, so you know, it can be out there in the sun. Uh, but only thing again, it's non-biodegradable. But these are basically best if you are printing something to actually use. These will hold up well better. So just uh, quickly, so other supplies you need, you need, you know, you, you need an SD card for file transfer from your computer to the to the three D printer. Uh, you need some uh, just uh, regular hand tool like a like a excuse me, a paint paint scraper. Uh, craft blades, wire cutter, and small pliers because, as I said, you have the main filament and then you have the, dis the dissolvable filament uh, that will print and you gotta basically when you get your 3D print out it will be encrusted in this white dissolvable filament and you need to use wire cutter and whatnot to, to remove as much as you can but then after you do that you have you dissolve it in oil uh, orange terpene and that dissolves the rest of the dissolvable filament also, uh, just a helpful hint is duct tape on the printer bed uh, helps uh, things from sticking to it. It's easier to get your get your uh, 3D print off. Okay, so a little bit more of the fun part. Um, well, let's let's look at some of the non-medical uses, and then we'll go into some of the medical uses of 3D printing. Again, uh, as with everything in 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 technology, medicine is usually a little behind. So some of these uh, non-medical uses are a little more more have a little bit more of a wow factor right now. So, you know, uh, games, art, design. You know, people make figurines right now. Some people just, you know, just modern art. Uh, people create with uh, with three D printing. 
um, design. They're, they're a company out there who pr prototyping architecture and whatnot, building and stuff, and stuff like that, will, will use 3D printing to show their you know, customers how a certain building or what will um, show. So this company, Zillit uh, Miniatures, makes uh, uh, miniatures for, for you know, Advanced Engine Dragons or whatever uh, type of game you're playing. Uh, it's it's uh, used in fashion, so this is actually it's actually pretty cool. So these are wearable shoes right here. This company Continuum. Uh, what's actually very cool is um, I, mean, I forgot what the name of the of the company is, but uh, there is yeah Electroloom. So there's a company called Electroloom that is making a 3D printer that prints fabric, which is pretty amazing. So you can you'll be able to print your own uh, shirts and stuff at home. Uh, but you know, in jewelry, with another, another thing, also rapid proto prototyping. So sometimes you can either make, you know, watches or you know, iPhone cases uh, straight from your 3D printer, or you can you can make it so it's pr prototyped, so that then what do you call it? They can you know make sure they know how it looks, and then they can make a mold uh, for it. Um, this is also pretty cool. Uh, food. So food is getting 3D printed now. Uh, so this this company Natural Mach Machines is releasing. I think I'm not sure if it's already out or it's coming. It's coming out at the end of this year. Uh, a 3D printer called Foodini, which uh, can 3D print food. So th they have different chambers. Uh, so basically, you have your ingredient list. You have different chambers. You just put it in there. It uh, emulsifies it and heats it up, and it prints out a pizza or lasagna or or, or whatever you're whatever you're hungry for, which I think is Really amazing, really cool. Um, the other thing, what what what's out there now is kind of large scale and distance manufacturing. So, a uh, company, Local Motors, has recently, uh, I forgot, the North American Motor Show or something to that nature, just recently print, printed out a large scale car. So they, the whole body of that car. Uh, I think it was like 20 some 20 some pieces that they glued together, but it was printed and they printed it at, at while they're at the, at the auto show and it drives around and it's a fully functional car, which is pretty amazing. Um, distance manufacturing. So when uh, NASA when they went up on to uh, repair some things on the International Space Station uh, recently, uh, they sent a schematic or a, or a, a STL file for a certain type of socket wrench. Which they had a zero gravity 3D printer up in space, and they were able to print it and um, use it to fix the you know whatever whatever socket was was uh, not working up there. So some more stuff. Now let's move into the medical space. What's out there? So there's a lot with uh, custom prosthetics. Um, you know, so this is this is one company, 3D Systems. Uh, well, they just bought it. I forgot the original name, but they just bought this company. Um, where you know they make custom prosthetics. So one thing in medicine uh, is that a lot of times when people have, you know, for some reason they have to get amputated, right? Peripheral vascular disease or whatnot. You, we always have certain sites, you know, either AKA, BKA, you know, certain places. And the reason we do that, you know, uh, is because the prosthesis that are out there currently are only for those levels, right? So if someone if someone's half of his calf is um, is fine, we still will amputate them just below the knee because there's no half calf prosthesis. But with custom prosthesis, there there's a you know the future of preserving more of your limb um, or and getting better ergonomics or even customizing how it looks uh, for these prosthesis. Um, let's see. So so there's also so. Here we have the reconstruction of the skull. Uh, what's the name of this company? Let's see. Yes, yeah, uh, Osteofab. So Osteofab is a company that's now printing titanium um, uh, reconstructive plates for the skull. So you know, there's there's been if you just Google search uh, Osteofab or or cranial titanium uh, reconstruction, you'll see plenty of different hospitals. China, I think one. Just recently here, I forgot exactly where, maybe Wake Forest or Hopkins, where the pediatric patient who, who was repaired, similar to this, uh, where they could put a titanium plate in there exactly 
how uh, what how you know it makes it look like look fine. And they don't have to make that hole any bigger or anything. They don't have to make the ostomy any bigger. Um, another thing they're using now, actually, actually, it's actually this is um, out there and used by a lot of dentists is 3D printing for for crowns and plates. Um, they just take a you know short CT scan or tomography of your um, of your mouth, and then they can see exactly where to put, put plates in. Is is a custom fit for you? So here is another company, which is uh, this is this is this is kind of crazy to me. This is a company or or Organovo, which is printing actual tissue. So this is liver tissue. It's not implantable into a human. However. Um, for drug toxicity, you can get uh, liver tissue printed and see how it deals with drug toxicity. But it's still relatively new, but uh, it's these are things that our people are doing out there. This is probably operative lines. This is probably what uh, is one of the first things that people did in medicine with 3D printing, and it's probably the thing that many hospitals are actually doing now. So. You know, a lot of pediatric, pediatric cardi cardiac an uh, anomalies are very complicated, and you know, no matter how many times you look at the CT and MR, uh, there's nothing beats just actually holding it in your hand and being able to dissect it before you open the kid's chest up, and you're uh, on a time limit, right? So, what what they're doing is uh, originally just with CT data, and, and more recently, I think one company actually uh, has done it with MR data. Is print out the pediatric heart. That way, the pediatric cardiac surgeon can go through it and see exactly what needs to be changed, what needs to, you know, uh, be switched. And that way, when they go uh, into surgery, they're not surprised. Um, this is being used not just in, like, this is this is one of the main use cases out there right now. But people are using this for fracture, for uh, prosthesis plates placement. Uh, again, like I said, reconstructive surgery, facial fractures. There's a lot out there uh, for operative planning. So those are kind of the uses um, that I found in, in medicine. There are some other things that are kind of in the research stage uh, currently, but um, you know, every every day someone's coming out with a new paper with with something else going on. So again, this is this is probably the most exciting part for me of this presentation is kind of teaching you guys how to 3D print because you know there's plenty of ideas. A lot of people, you know, don't know where to find a 3D printer. Um, you know, you can either buy one. Again, like I said, 800 to 3,000 dollars for a decent one that you can buy. Um, the way that we did most of our projects is our uh, medical library uh, actually bought one. Um, no one really knew about it. I don't. I'm not really sure why they just bought it just to keep it. And on just just randomly, I saw it one day and I was like, hey, are we allowed to use that? And so it's much cheaper because if you print a 3D print and you get someone else to print it for you, it's. Uh, I'll show you my slab that I had is about six inches by four inches by one cent, you know, whoa, half an inch, and that was eight dollars to print. But when I asked a company to print it, they already charged me a hundred dollars. So it's much cheaper if you can find your own printer or or have your own printer. Um, and you know, there's plenty of ideas out there. It'd be fun. If someone started doing uh, different things. So the first thing to do is acquire the data, right? So right now, uh, if it's your first 3D print, probably the easiest way and probably the most uh, comfortable way, us being in medicine, is to go to the uh, National Institute of Health 3D Printing Exchange. It's a repository of, of STL files which you could literally just download and plug it into your 3D printer and it'll start printing. And they're all, all anatomically correct. So they're all from CT data. So you know that's that's uh, that's one good place to start. There is uh, Thingiverse, which is this probably the number one um, non-medical uh, repository for STLs. But if you just go online, type in you know STL repository, 3D printing repository, there's there's plenty of uh, uh, repositories out there. Another way to get the data, you can scan objects. So if you look at that picture in the middle, um, it's actually from MakerBot. It's a 3D scanner, which has a plate in the middle. It rotates, and they have a scanner on two sides. So you can scan all kinds of different objects. Um, they also make handheld scanners as well. Um, or what you can do is uh, you can create uh, your STL with uh, software. So, you know, If you're in the medical space, 
uh, uh, programs such as Philips IntelliSpace uh, Terra Re or Terra Recon, and there's other ones out there uh, can do the trick. You know, you can take a, take CT data, MR data, uh, do uh, MIPS uh, of them. Uh, you know, and uh, you can export them as a mesh or a STL, uh, and um, and there you go. Um, if you want to use other programs such as 3D Code, 3DS Max, ZBrush, you can build build uh, 3D images from scratch uh, that way as well. So that's how you acquire your data. Next, you know, you have to you have set up your printer. Uh, you have to calibrate your printer every so often, especially when you first get it. Make sure the printer bed is leveled. Uh, the reason you do all these checks is because some of these jobs are like 10, 11 hours, and if one thing is off, it can just make one bubble in the filament and ruin your whole print, and then you've wasted a day and wasted a bunch of filament. So you have to make sure you know each time the printing bed is leveled, and there's enough filament, make sure it's loaded, and the extruders are not clogged up, uh, and, uh, and make sure the, the printer comes up to heat before you send the print off. Um, so for the data, what you have to do is... Uh, you have to uh, run it through, well, what you should do is open, run it through MeshLab. It's an open source uh, program that's out there that, that makes sure that there's no non-manifold geometry, uh, again, so that it will actually print properly. So uh, manifold geometry is when two or more planes share one corner. So like a T would be manifold geometry. You can't print that because these are not actually touching in, in when it's, when it's uh, doing 3D printing. Um, and then the program itself will have a slicer program where you put in the STL file there and it will uh, make sure it can actually print it. It will, it, will, it will make a new type of file that you're going to put straight to your SD card and into the printer. Um, but what this program does, this slicer program, is it, it, it gets all the layers exactly what the, what the um, printer has to do. So SD card into the printer and you begin. So this is one of the prints I did. Let's see what works here. So this is this is the maker box uh, printing a axial CT scan or CT slab rather. Uh, the, uh, like the white stuff there, that's a lot of uh, of the trusses that uh, that can be dissolved away. Um, the actual blue stuff is the actual actual filament and so this 3D head just, uh, 3D print just, just keeps on going and uh, prints layer by layer and then that, that bed with each uh, subsequent layer goes down about a millimeter. The resolutions change, um, uh, most resolutions are about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters with this type of 3D printing it's, you can actually see a little stair stepping um, with the powder, the, the different other other types that we talked about, those are much you know much higher quality uh, imaging, and that's that's another thing that we learned was that um, you only you only need your file to be as uh, high resolution as you can print. There's no reason to have a you know 0 0.01 millimeter resolution uh, STL file if you can't if you can only print at 0.1. So then again, post processing, super some sometimes a very large uh, you know. Um, Print. You have to glue them together like that car. You, you can you can paint things, but again, they're only one color, so you know sometimes you have to paint things. Sand paper to uh, to uh, that's misspelled. To what do you call it? Um, smooth it out. Uh, you can also use heated like a heated acetone vapor bath to smooth it out. Also, um, there's a lot of images on, on on the web on exactly how to do that. So then, what's the, what do you do? You're you know just you're done, right? So this is was this was my first 3D print. So this is data from a CT scan of the pelvis. So what's cool is that this is not like a model or artist rendering of a of a pelvis. This is actually some someone's actual pelvis. Uh, I think that's 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 pretty remarkable, pretty cool. Um, so just just a little show and tell, though. Like this is something I just presented recently at the New York Med Medical Im Imaging Informatics uh, Symposium. Uh, one thing we did was that um, we saw that the need for clinicians to un better understand uh, CT data. You know, in medical school, we 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 operate or we dissect 
uh, in an admin lab, but a lot of times the visual space that we get there doesn't translate to Axial uh, data. So this uh, concept we had was to segment out the entire human body uh, using um, the NIH uh, Visual Human Project. They have, they have CT data for us. Uh, and then uh, print m multiple slabs that are stackable. That way you can see the um, axial skeleton or the axial anatomy, but as well as know where it is in the Z plane. Uh, and so that's something that we did um, just a while ago. And that's that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, that'd be that'd be great. Thanks, Thanks uh, Dr. Krishi. That was an excellent talk. And, um, um, clearly, clearly uh, uh, there's, there's a lot. I was just uh, thinking about how uh, 3D printing can be used in different aspects of uh, medicine and, and more specifically medical imaging. Um, and not a whole lot comes to mind when I think about my own field, which is nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. But I, I think um, 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 it may have more application in um, abdominal imaging, which is your domain. And then, of course, uh, same question goes to Dr. Um, uh, Awan when it comes to MSK. So what are your uh, guys' thoughts on that? No, definitely. I, I think, like I said, um, there's a lot going on right now in prosthetics. Uh, for example, we have uh, one of my attendings over here is doing uh, a project on, on printing different, well, he's already published, uh, printing a scapula. That way, people who need a prosthesis, they can actually see how the glenoid fossa is shaped, uh, and it better helps them better develop a certain prosthetic for so there, there's there's multiple ways of uh, of using 3D printing. Hmm. You know, one one thing I want to share with you guys is something I saw this morning, uh, and I posted on Internet Medicine, and it applies actually both to radiology and 3D printing. Ooh. This is this is a 3D printing uh, of a child in utero with a cleft palate. Yeah. And and what I thought of, when, maybe I can ask you guys, is that. How good is ultrasound at diagnosing something like a cleft palate in utero? Uh, do you need 3D printing for that? Do you guys know anything about that? Well, I mean, I, I know when you use 3D ultrasound, it's, it's a little bit easier to pick up, but uh, no, I, I don't really read um, uh, like second, third trimester ultrasounds. I'm not 100% sure how hard it is. Okay, well, apparently they're having success with 3D printing. Like printing it out, just like you said, from a MRI. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, one one thing that I I, I, I did in the past was get uh, 4D uh, or 3D images from from ultrasound and actually etch it into a crystal. This is before I knew about 3D printing, which, which is very similar to this, where you know you can see different anomalies a lot better uh, with 3D printing. A lot of this goes along with the whole. Uh, you know, surgical planning. So once you can hold actually not normally in your hand, it makes it easier. You know, it can decrease your operative time when you go in and you already know what anomaly is. You're not you're not you know fooled by any 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 tricks, right? right. I mean, I, I think there there are some unanswered questions. Uh, one big one is who pays? Some of these things cost a lot of money, right? Uh, yeah. who, who right now insurance companies won't pay for 3D printing. Not not any that I know of at least. So that's that's a big question out there. I mean, I don't know, um, I, I don't know how much research has been done showing that it it uh, has a considerable, you know, uh, it, it it considerably reduces operative times and all this thing. I know there's a lot of smaller studies, but I don't think there's any large definitive studies that would push an insurance company or the government to actually start paying for for 3D printing. But everyone's excited about it, so it's one of those things where you know I you know. Uh, I know some orthopods who, you know, almost demand 3D printing, but no one pays for it. So then someone has, the hospital has to eat it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Dr. Awan, any thoughts on, on the topic? Yeah, thank you, first of all, Imran, for such a wonderful and fabulous talk on 3D printing. I think one, I mean, certainly it has a lot of uh, uh, applications with, you know, cosmetic surgery, preoperative planning, and I think from a standpoint of musculoskeletal or emergency radiology, uh, classifying fractures like complex fractures such as you know Lefort fractures or acetabular fractures as you mentioned already. My question to you was can you give listeners an idea of you know the time frame it takes to, to sort of do this and A 
how long does it take, and B, is it applicable, you know, in a, in a radiology setting, for example, in a, in a busy emergency trauma radiology service where we're reading, you know, maybe 100 studies a night, would it be applicable to do this in a timely fashion without getting behind um, when you're reading them? I mean, studies to classify, you know, acetabular fractures better, better or Lefort fractures better. No, no, definitely. I, I, I don't think this is in the, it's not fast enough for making a diagnosis of anything. Um, a lot of it is more for, I think, I think it's still in the realm of pre-surgical planning. So, for example, if you have a complex acetabular fracture, you know, it's, it's, you know, anterior and posterior, you know, whatever, uh, it, you, have to, you have to just do that through, through imaging, uh, you know, printing. For example, this, I don't know if you can see it here, but this sacrum, Took about eleven hours to print. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be waiting eleven hours for a tiny piece of thing to print, right? Most of it's uh, and and then you know making prosthe uh, prosthetics. Uh, it's not it, they're, they're, it gets faster and faster every year. Three uh, D printing. Maybe there'll be a time where you can just print out stuff and make a diagnosis, you know, better. You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes you know that. I mean, we see that too. Sometimes we will read a scan, we'll make our diagnosis, but then the Orthopod before they go into surgery, they want a 3D reconstruction, not a print, but actual 3D reconstruction. So, you know, it might work out that way where you know there there is a five-hour delay where it can be printed. But again, for which ones and all right, you know, we're going to do all the medical waste. Are you going to throw all these away? You know, the some of them are. You know, as I said, the one type is uh, biodegradable, the other type is not. You know, you just and if you do that for every person with a fracture, <laughs> that would be a considerable medical waste out there. Right. Um, one thing you did mention about um, how it can be applied in tissue engineering, where um, th now that is an interesting, um, uh, you know, domain because there is a lot of focus on how uh, instead of carrying out long clinical trials, they're trying to sample human tissues and, and see how uh, different agents, uh, be it radio pharmaceuticals or, or regular pharmaceuticals or, or environmental toxins, uh, what kind of impact they have on what could be a representative set of human tissues. So yeah. it looks like um, um, 3D printing can help us in that too. Yeah, that that sounds amazing. I mean, that I, I try to uh, understand exactly what they're doing, but I truthfully, I, I'm not exactly sure how they're making that work. It sounds pretty amazing what they're doing. Um, I don't know if it can ever get to a place where we can make organs. I mean, I don't know how you would, you know, the vasculature, all that stuff would work. But, um, but one thing Wake Force is doing is they've found a way to, it's, it's like this, uh, they, they 3D print an organic uh, substance that, that acts like cartilage and is very porous. So someone who's an ear, they can print an ear. Uh, it's not plastic. It's this organic type material. Uh, it's porous and they can place it there and then, um, your body will actually fill in the hole so it, so it stays uh, stays in place. Wow. Yeah, it almost looks like, you know, you take 3D printing, all that 3D printing can do, and then you take stem cells, and the only missing piece is, like, how to create the microenvironment, and all of a sudden you, you know, uh, are in, in at the next level. But this is uh, fascinating stuff, and uh, John or uh, Dr. Awan, do you have any more questions? Um, oh, just, just a couple of comments. Yeah, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, and this cer certainly is a growing field. Um, I've talked to some labs where they say part of the uh, equipment of the lab now is a 3D printer uh, to, to, to get parts for the machines, etc. I know it's not medical, but it's more like an industrial type of application. Yeah. But one one lab person said, yeah, we have a 3D printer. If something breaks down, we print out the part and fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes everything a lot. I mean, it's it's something that, I mean, it's been around for a while. I mean, actually, in since the mid '80s, so it didn't get popular until for the early '90s. So it hasn't been around for too long. So, but what's what's been driving all this is that now that's in it's in the consumer space, and you know, 2008, nine when the first one came out, and now there's all these uh, 3D printing enthusiasts out there just printing away because you can, you know, you know, people are wearing. There, there's whole shirts and stuff like there's people wearing costumes and you know all kinds of different things uh, with 3D printing. Yeah, one thing I do know is that I don't want to wait 11 hours for my pizza. <laughs> <laughs> one but, last, uh, one yeah, last question to fight is: uh, Have you ever had 3D printed food? No. Has anybody ever had? 
Imran, do you have? Uh, have, you ever heard of it? I have not, but uh, I mean, I'm kind of afraid of it. But yeah, you know, I wonder try, what it tastes like. I would try it though. No, I mean, again, what what it is? They have like um, what they say, Alice's. They have like different reservoirs, and you put in the ingredients, right? So I guess you put like flour in one, water in one, and mushroom, oh. in one, and then it, it somehow emulsifies it and heats it up and oh. put, prints it out. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that there would have to be different printers, a uh, set of printers, because you can't be using the same printers for glass and plastic and then yeah, use yeah, the same yeah, for, yeah. for yeah. cheese, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that it's should be pretty special. carcinogenic. Yeah, it would be, be specialized. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Houdini. So yeah. I, I think it's coming out, or or it just came out. But uh, yeah, I think I think that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, again, uh, excellent talk and a lot of uh, interesting discussion. And um, thank you for that. And uh, we have the tweet board running, so we we it, it is it is likely that we'll have some questions later, and we'll be happy to follow up on that and send them to you, and so that you can um, uh, you know answer them um, if there are any. Yeah, and uh, you're welcome anytime to you know come back and, and give another talk on on either something related or something more focused on, on abdominal imaging. Uh, sure. So you're always welcome. And you know, uh, thanks again. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thank you, right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. I'm Bennett, broadcasting from Miami. Today we have another in a series of neurosurgical hangouts, and today Richard Mendel from uh, from St. Petersburg, Florida, is going to be talking about lumbar spine pathology. You know, also grace with the presence of Catherine Cove, neurosurgeon from New York. So we're going to, going to go on the panel first and introduce everyone, and we'll start with Catherine. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a practicing neurosurgeon in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm also a multimedia artist with an emphasis on medical art. Good to be here. Very good. And Catherine will be starting a channel on interviewing uh, MDs in, in the arts. And Simon. Hello, everyone. Uh, from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I'm a medical student and clinical psychologist. I'm looking forward to this hangout. And welcome, Simon. 3 a.m. in, in uh, Japan. Jesse. Hi, everyone. Jesse Contra here, joining you from Philadelphia. I'm uh, a graduate student. Nice to be here. Welcome, uh, Jesse. And he Young. Hello, I'm Dr. Hee Young Kim in Seoul, Republic of Korea. I work in my private ENT clinic. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, and welcome, Hee. It's also uh, 3 o'clock in the morning in Seoul. I thank you, <laughs> I thank you for, coming, for being dedicated. The yeah, yeah. Yours. Okay, Richard. It's my pleasure. It's all, it's all yours. Okay. Let's make sure everything's in working order now. Yeah. yeah, I think that there just must be some conflict. Yeah, let me just do it this one. Okay. You know, it's just not letting me advance. You know. Maybe it's a built-in conflict from Google to... to um, it worked before. We yeah, but try to do the same thing. There you go. Um, uh, you usually get it working through it. We can always have a take three. That's how it is in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, well. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I can see it moving around the screen. Have you used PowerPoint before to do? Oh, there yeah. you go. It, it, it moved. Okay, there it is. Moving now. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. There you go. So th this really 
for Catherine and Tomas, this is really way above your levels. I mean, way below your levels. But that's I think okay. It's just something I, I wanted to do something uh, uh, relatively brief, but that you could always w use as kind of a primer because in, in medical school, you know, we just didn't learn the. We learned about the spine, but the anatomy of the spine is so uh, so much more than just a pedicle, a vertebral body, and a lamina that a lot of times you start your rotations and, and you really don't know how to localize a disc in, on an MRI. So I'm just going to give you some things that I think help you plan for something as common or garden variety as a lumbar disc herniation. So this is an MRI of uh, someone who um, has a relatively good-looking MRI for his age. Uh, he's got a small tarlock cyst, but it's it's um, asymptomatic, and a, a nice full lumbar thecal sac. But um, of course, it can be much more difficult than, than that. So um, I wanted to show. This is a, a recent MRI of somebody I saw in clinic last week. And this cut here, th this is, of course is a, a, a sagittal image. And this cut, I think it's cut 36, it is this um, axial image here. And what you see is a large herniated disc in the right lateral recess and some fluid in this joint here. But as a student, you may not really know how to open up and find that and nowadays with the spine surgery becoming so minimally invasive you really want to try to localize things very carefully and uh, you know, also make your life a lot easier. So this is a woman and Catherine she was not in one of your affiliate hospitals but she was in another very prestigious hospital system. She went into an ER because she was walking around and she had terrible um, uh, back pain and right lower extremity pain and it was you know following a sciatic distribution but she, as she was walking in, in Manhattan she all of a sudden had this terrible pain and then she had all the pain in a, in a femoral distribution and so we're going to come back to her later but I just wanted to show this this X-ray because you know the pedicle length here is kind of important because if the pedicle length is genetically long, you're going to have a big wide canal. But if you have genetically short pedicles, the canal is going to be significantly reduced, um, and that's often the difference between somebody that has routine um, stenosis that is degenerative versus somebody that has a congenital stenosis. So the pedicle length is important and um, now what we'll look at is a few diagrams. This is from the um, OKU4, the Orthopedic Knowledge Update 4, which was the spine section and it was done by uh, Raj Rao and um, um, it, it, these line drawings are really uh, pretty good to look at when you're really first trying to find your way around the spine. So, of course, here's the pedicle, right? So you can imagine if the pedicle is going to be reduced, the circumference is going to be reduced. Um, here, um, you're looking at the pedicle, which a lot of people talk about as the bridge from the front to the back of the spine. These are your posterior elements, and here's your intervertebral foramen and you know the pars is the portion uh, of the um, uh, bone posteriorly that, that's really very important for um, um, stability. Now the facet joints can be a little bit confusing. You'll see that the inferior articular proce process is the top process to the facet joint. The superior articular process is called that because it comes off the superior side of L5. The inferior articular process here is the inferior process of 4. 
So it, do, it does make sense, but it could be a little counterintuitive. But this is your facet joint. And so in the lumbar spine, you have a root exiting, which will be the, um, the exiting root here will be the numbered vertebrae. Um, so, for instance, as you look at a cutaway of the, the spine, this is at, at the beginning of the pedicle. Now, remember the pedicle has a waist, so the, the um, pedicle thins out quite a bit uh, in the middle portion of the pedicle and then kind of opens up again. So the pedicle can look large here, but it can actually be quite small with, very, with a lot less cancellous bone than you would expect. But as you see here, you're going to see the L4 root exiting below the L4 pedicle, which is different than the cervical spine. L5 root exiting below the L5 pedicle. But this, of all the slides today, this is the most important one. And this one, let's see, well, these two are the most important. John, uh, Dr. McCullough, John McCall, he was in... Dayton, Ohio for many, many years. He wrote an excellent, he was an orthopod who wrote an excellent uh, book on microsurgery of the lumbar spine. And he, he would talk about this y-axis house analogy where the pedicle was the roof of the house. And then, you know, this is in a um, y-axis. So in a cutaway view, think of the pedicle as the roof of the house. And then think of the area below the pedicle as the infrapedicular level, and then you'll have the discal level. Then you start over again with the, the next segment. But the x-axis, um, that kind of got described um, not, not at the same time with, the, with Dr. McCullough's y-axis analogy, but... There you have central lateral axis foraminal and extra foraminal. So this is a great diagram that came out of the Orthopedic Knowledge Update 4, but it's been recopied from Dr. McCullough's publications. Um, so he, here, here you are at the pedicle level. So PID, pedicle, infrapedicular, and discal. So you want to um, kind of look at your MRIs in a way that you can locate this, the um, disc herniation or fragment in three dimensions, but you only need to know the X and the Y. The, the MRI tells you the Z, but that's not the decision you have to make at, at surgery. At surgery, you need to know where in that inner space to start looking. And um, so a cent the central disc herniation is really the widest area. It's really the whole canal. But you'll see the lateral recess is where the nerve begins to exit the foramen. Um, and then you have your foraminal disc herniations, which tend to really, really hurt a lot. Because if it's out in the foramen, the nerve is often pushed back into the bony anatomy there in the back of the canal, usually into the um, superior articular process. Then, then you, you have an extra foraminal disc. And I must say, I haven't seen many extra foraminal discs in quite a while until one I'm going to show you. So, recently in clinic, I, I've just seen huge soft disc herniations that I, I rarely ever see, especially in Florida where you have a, a big elderly population, and usually, you know, after about the sixth decade, the some of those discs are pretty desiccated. But this is a tremendously large disc herniation with L5S1, and you're able to localize it right to the discal level and the inferior particular level. So with good fluoro and marking these the space where you want to enter in terms of X and Y, you, you have a pretty good idea of, of finding this. Now, here is another. This is a separate patient. This is a young woman, and this is a tremendously large disc herniation here at L5. And, of course, it, it's 
it's, it's a central herniation, but it takes up a, a giant portion of the canal. Okay, now <clears throat> this um, this is an image to kind of demonstrate to you again the x-axis. So here again, this large space, this interlaminar space, which is where you would place an epidural start injection right into this epidural space. For the most part, this is a central disc herniation across here. The lateral recess will begin about here and here. Then you're going to be in the foramen, which is small, but you know, once once the disc is in the foramen, patients tend to have tremendous pain, and you really have to be um, scrupulous in looking at the lateral cuts. Don't look at just the middle of the MRI. You have to look at the lateral cuts um, to rule out a foramen or an extra foramen or disc formulation. So, um, this again is the woman who was in Manhattan. And what, what happened, I think, is going to be evident in a minute. But she came to me, and she hadn't had any MRIs yet. Boy, she was in tremendous pain, and like I said, she described her pain as going down the um, back of her leg in a sciatic kind of distribution, but she had hurt for a while before she, the, the, this particular day in Manhattan, but it got so bad in Manhattan, she described this feeling where her back was just terrible, and then the pain started to go down the front of the leg. And this is what I think happened. And um, take a look at this MRI and, and look carefully at it. But um, do, do you look at this four or five disc. I mean, her problem localizes to really up to the thigh, thigh level. And I um, just take a look at this axial cut here and see what you think. This is a huge extra foraminal disc herniation. I, ha I think it's the largest one I've ever seen out there. But this foraminal disc herniation is a giant piece of disc that broke off. And I think while she was walking, she extruded it out the foramen and then was hitting the um, more the uh, fourth nerve root. And that's when she was started to get a lot of femoral symptoms. And, you know, to go in the midline here to operate on her, you would have to go quite a ways to get out to this disc. But the best incision for this was really a um, um, what's called a Wiltsy. Leon Wiltsy was an orthopod and he used to do this Wiltsy incision. It's about three and a half to four centimeters off the midline. And you can feel this. You can palpate on the back and feel where these muscle fat, you know, large fascicles are. And so the incision was made here, and then you just could place a finger right down through this fatty plane, and you'll come right up to what? The fourth nerve root. And I brought a microscope in, and all I had to do was just take a um, um, nerve hook and set the root free and try to mobilize it a little bit. And then all I did was simply squeeze the disc right out, and it, it came out beautifully. But this is very unusual. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen one this large um, in all the time I've been practicing. But... Um, that was essentially it. I just wanted to give you a kind of format for how to how to understand where where a disc is going to be in relation to what you see on the MRI. Um, that's that's essentially it. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> very very good, Richard. Thank you very much for a clear presentation. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we got going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to quickly uh, introduce Carlos Numaguano. Hello, Carlos. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, John. Uh, Catherine, uh, excuse me, Carlos, to your right is uh, Catherine Coe, a neurosurgeon from New York. 
Carl, unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute yourself there. Hey, Ben. And uh, you, I think you've met Richard before. Yeah. Hey, Carlos. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, Catherine. I guess you'll start off for any comments or questions for, for Richard. I think that's a very good presentation, and actually, you. Uh, you overestimated me. I learned a lot. You know, particularly important reminded me about the pedicle length. I think that's key, not only in uh, lumbar disc surgery, but also looking at that pedicle is very important for fusion. I've become very, very appreciative of the pedicle. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I think people underestimate the anatomy of the spine and they think, well, the brain is so much more complex. I, I disagree. I think that uh, when you're operating on the disc, the field of view is so small that you really have to nail your anatomy. So thank you again for emphasizing those very important points. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that whenever I have trouble localizing a disc, it's because I skip. I don't preoperatively plan as well as I should. If you just go through this little plan, I try to do it every, every disc acting. If you go through the little plan, it seems like things go an awful lot easier than, um, than um, when you skip that step. Can, uh, Richard, can you give a percentage? How many people have long pedicles and so how many have short? It's well, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a genetic thing and a lot of people are very interested in that. It, it's big. It's a big research project among the veterinary uh, schools because you know things like animals like dachshunds have tremendously short pedicles, and a lot of achondroplastic dwarfs have very short pedicles as well. And the guys that see those cases the most are often the scoliosis surgeons. But yeah, a short pedicle results in a greatly diminished diameter or uh, circumference of the canal. And, and that's, um, that's bad news because removing the lamina in somebody that has congenital uh, stenosis does effectively nothing. You kind of destabilize them by doing that. Um, you, you really need to try to give them more room by doing a um, intervertebral like a, a lateral approach where you're going to give them more surface area not by opening the canal up from behind but by placing a larger graft into a distance that's not quite as high and giving them more room that way. It's more of what would be an indirect compression. But when you take the lamina off, I mean, in my experience, the lamina is usually of the three columns in the spine, the anterior, middle, and posterior, the posterior columns almost never involved. And that, that, that's including with oncology. It's almost always the anterior or middle columns where you see um, oncologic problems and where you see degenerative problems. Um, when you get a thickened facet joint and the patient gets older and the yellow ligament thickens, they do get um, a focal stenosis at the disc level that is treated with a, a laminar decompression just over the disc level, but you don't want to decompress over the um, infrapedicular level, and of course you can't decompress at the pedicular level. So, yeah. So, Richard, so every time you take someone to the R, you look at the x rays to, make, to, to get a gauge of. It was the size of the pedicle. Every patient you bring. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you have to. I mean, that should be your pre-op routine, because, you know, even though it may be a, a garden variety disc, it's, you know, to that patient it's a big deal. And it, it just makes it so much easier to make your marks, your X and your Y marks on floor, on the skin, and. Yeah. Like, for instance, the woman that had that large extra foraminal disc, I held the nerve root up to her to her side just to judge where where I wanted to be, and I put it right over the frame and where I thought the disc was going to be, and that, that kind of told me that I was in the right place in terms of 
my Y axis, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you know, uh, that's interesting, Rich. I, I thought, I know you meticulously go over the MRI before taking, but what other, is there any other things you look at on the regular x ray? Uh, or mostly just pedicle length, that's about it. I like to look at the x rays, especially for cervical spine. I, I think I get a lot out of the x rays in cervical spine. But, um, yeah, for lumbar spine, you want to know what their lordosis is like, and and you're interested to know if they've lost disc space height, a lot of disc space height, because um, that can often identify your level. But the MRIs really pretty much become, you know, the routine, the gold standard these days. Right, that's, that's the thing you really go over. Uh, do you have, I know you're joined late, uh, Carlos, but uh, do you have any comments or questions? On looking at the like like X-rays before uh, operating on the L spine. Yeah. Do, does he have a routine or any tricks he goes through? I don't know. Do you, Carlos? Do you operate much on the L spine, Carlos? I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, that's it. Can you hear okay, Carlos? Now you're now you're muted. Now unmute, please. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll go on. A any other uh, questions from the panel or comments? Simon? Um, I have a question. I think, uh, I think Carlos is able to talk now. Oh, okay. Carlos, yeah. can you talk now? Oh. I think he's unmuting when he's talking. He's oh, is he? Good, good I think Dr. Here. Carlos is uh, muting when you're talking oppositely. Uh, oh, perhaps. Carlos, you're unmuted now. You can speak. No. <laughs> Something's okay. wrong. Uh, in Spanish, they call it Albert Vez, in reverse. That's okay. why I was asking a question Simon, then. Did you, did you have a question or a comment, sure. Simon? Um, sure, this is a uh, medical student question. I'm fascinated with the anatomy. Thank you very much for, for showing that. And of course, it's, it's much more than I, I'm used to. Um, but. Uh, uh, I sort of have this this fear that you know perhaps you you get to participate in a surgery. Imagine you got to be um, a resident and then you didn't know where you were. But one time you had mentioned that one of your professors had actually had brought out an atlas, or they had uh, actually looked at a uh, uh, some yeah. some photos. And I was wondering what 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 in the situation. Of course, there's preparation before. He was a, when you, hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. He was a very, very famous neurosurgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a brilliant man, but he used to keep Gray's Anatomy in his in his locker. He would just carry it with him when he was doing peripheral nerve things or things he didn't do very often. But he, he happened to be a brilliant guy, and he used to say, "No, you know, there, there's no shame in using a map in a neighborhood you don't travel in much." And so, you know. Uh, I'm not embarrassed about that. I keep a model okay. in the OR anyway. It's continual learning then. That's, you don't, you, by the time you're a resident or you know everything, that's not the case. You continue in yeah. learning. Yeah, residents, we all think we know everything. We, yeah. The, the, the uh, um, yeah, I, I, you just, you, you just have to know if you, you're not familiar with something, you have to get familiar. And okay. You don't want to be embarrassed about it. You just want to do do the job. Yeah. I see. Right. You, Thank you. You know, you know, Richard and, and maybe Catherine could come on this too. Uh, now that three D printing is becoming more prominent, with actually printing three D printing the body parts before the surgeon goes in there. I know cardiovascular surgeons are using that to show anomalous uh, vessels in the heart. They're, they're actually three D printing, uh, especially in, in children. They're getting 3D prints of the anatomy before they cut. Uh, do you, have you heard, Catherine, you can comment on this too. Have you heard of any neurosurgeons 3D printing any parts of the brain or spinal cord before they cut? Uh, not, no, I haven't heard of any. Okay, maybe but, that's not been. Um, there's a yeah, it calls to mind, you know, when you talk about the anatomy, and sometimes, you know, you get in there and you're momentarily you don't know where you are, that uh, when we went from open discectomies to using the tube, uh, there was a learning curve, even though the anatomy was the same, the field of view was so much smaller. 
Yeah. And what I always felt was that once I knew where the pedicle was, uh, I, I home, the bone is home. And so once I knew where the pedicle was, no matter what size tube I was using, it gave me a lot of confidence. So you'll pick your landmarks, your familiar landmarks, which will like um, kind of pebbles on the trail to show you where you are. And some people have different landmarks, but for me, if I know where that pedicle is, I'm good. So that, that that's the place you really look for the pedicle first when you first get there. Yeah, pedicle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If you look in Ed Benzel's recent book, I guess this is the the spine surgery text on complication avoidance. You know, I was looking at the anatomy there of of, of the spine in a sagittal view, and there are so many names that you don't. I don't ever think of, but I, I had a friend who was an orthopod, he always he was always comfortable as long as he, he was on bone. But he would look for the mammary mm -hmm. process all the time when we were for pedicle screws. But as soon as he saw that he was comfortable. You know, we we all have our different comfort levels and you don't necessarily need to memorize every name. You just have to be comfortable and you know, finding your uh, safe places where, where you you start, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to uh, the spine to spine surgeons, the anatomy is so complicated. But as medical students, I don't remember much other than remembering the thoracic spinous processes were angled way down, and I didn't know much difference between cervical and lumbar at that time. But now you can spend forty five minutes talking about one vertebral body segment. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> If you focus on any part of the body, your your zoom gets your zoomed in area gets gets quite quite a bit bigger and you know. Do, do you use special glasses? Do you use the microscope glasses uh, in the spine or that's? Um, I used to. Now uh, I just um, tend to wear. Um, I wear a, a goggle, not not a loop, not a loop. That's a little like 2.5, but really, if I'm getting old enough that if I have to squint, I just bring the microscope in. Period. <laughs> really? I, I don't. I, I don't really want to play around with the glasses because my vision's so bad. When, yeah. when the circulars take my glasses off, I can barely tell whether it's light, you know, night or day. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, to bring in the scope because I don't need glasses when I'm under the scope, but. Yeah, I just I just don't like fiddling around with that. So I wear contacts, a shield, and then I use, just use the scope. If I start squinting, I just get the scope. <laughs> okay, Carlos, is your audio okay? Do you have any comments, Carlos? Uh, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, Catherine, do you do much work on the spine, or is it mostly brain you work on? Uh, both. Oh, okay. A lot of uh, a lot of spinal instrumentation. Yeah, a lot of spinal instrumentation. But when I do a discectomy, I definitely use a microscope. I don't even put loops on. I just make an incision and bring the scope right in. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think you're losing. It's it's certainly, if, if the anatomy is confusing macroscopically, I can imagine with a microscope, it's triple confusing. So you you have to kind of get your landmarks before you get to the microscope, right? Um. A lot of times, I just open well enough that I, I I know I've uncovered the area I need, and then bring the scope in. And then, I, then I can, as soon as I bring the scope in, I just kind of get oriented. I probably I probably go through a checklist, but I'm not conscious of it. I I kind of look around, then I figure out where I am. Sometimes I'll put an instrument in and, and touch a few things, but yeah, you you just get used to it. By repetition. Okay. Okay. Any questions uh, from the rest of the panel? Okay. Okay. I guess uh, Carlos, uh, it's a wash for your audio today. We'll get it. We'll get it figured out before the next hangout. Yeah, I'll, I'll try not. I'll try to use Google Slides again. I think it goes smoother when you're using the Google apps. Okay. And, um, uh, I just threw this together on on. Um, 
PowerPoint. It's, I don't know. Okay. Really don't, hey, we can't be too self-critical. We'll get better at this. This, this is new. And Richard, I, uh, thank you for coming out today as usual. And thank you, Catherine, for coming by, and Carlos, and the rest of the panel. And hang thank around. We'll, we'll chat after it's over. Thank you very much. All right.